Hello everyone and welcome to SUNUP, I'm Lyndall Stout. We join you this week from the OSU Student Union where your local county extension educators from around Oklahoma are going back to class. This opportunity to engage face to face gives them ways to plan programs through the year for upcoming months and through the year. It gives them an opportunity to brainstorm about new ideas. Uh, but this is a, a live environment for a lot of that interaction to take place. We'll have more from the OSU Extension Conference a little later in the show. But first, we're learning about migratory birds and their seasonal patterns in Oklahoma. SUNUP's Curtis Hare takes us to Muskogee County. What we, what we see going on in, in January and February, we, we start getting a lot of, of wintering waterfowl, uh, lots of geese, Canada geese, snow geese. Uh, we get a wide variety of, of ducks that, that are wintering here in, in central Oklahoma. Waterfowl numbers fluctuate based on a number of factors, but the main one is weather. We may not see very many birds come down here because weather conditions north of here are are good for the birds and there's no need for them to, to go farther farther south to avoid uh, you know harsh winter conditions and when they come here they have ample amounts of food resources lots of open water so we get waste grain from cornfields sorghum uh, this wheat field here that the, that the geese will be feeding on and many Oklahoma grain producers are familiar with these tourists which has not always been the case what we've seen over probably the last uh, 50 50 years or so is that that waterfowl and especially geese have have taken advantage of of agricultural crops snow geese numbers that have have probably reached all-time highs we've never seen the kind of numbers we have snow geese and that is directly related to the fact that they've taken advantage of of these agricultural crops same thing with a lot of our Canada geese naturally some producers view these birds as freeloading nuisances rather than friendly visitors but there are some positives. There certainly are positive aspects uh, of having geese here. For example, if, you, if you're a producer that's interested in making some additional money in, in sort of a, in a waste grain field, so if you have a cornfield that's been harvested or, or sorghum, you're attracting geese, uh, a lot of producers now will lease out that land to hunters, and so that's additional, additional money in their pocket. Wintering waterfowl are also popular for public viewing. And management areas like the Sequoia National Wildlife Refuge in eastern Oklahoma help encourage and protect waterfowl and other migrating birds. So uh, a lot of the birds, uh, what we're kind of known for and what we were established for is, is waterfowl uh, and water birds. So a lot of these birds are traveling down the central flyway. Deputy Refuge Manager Damon Taylor says Oklahoma plays a vital role in the life cycle of migratory birds. Oklahoma falls kind of right in the middle of, of the central flyway. You get to the grasslands out in the west. Uh, it's very important for sandhill cranes, whooping cranes. Uh, a lot of geese use that type of area as well as shorebirds. Very important shorebird habitat uh, all throughout the state. Uh, the wetlands like the, the one you see behind me here are, are very important. Uh, a lot of people may kind of overlook the importance, but they have just as much of a nutrient uh, impact on a bird or any other type of wildlife diet as any other uh, type of vegetation such as agricultural fields. While the winter months are a good opportunity to see waterfowl, the peak movements for other migratory birds such as shorebirds is in the spring and early summer. I'm Curtis Hare. With the turn of the calendar to a new year, that means we're just a few weeks away from the start of the spring calving operations for those uh, operations here in Oklahoma that do most of their calving starting around the 1st of February and into March. And I think this is a good time to refresh our memories about what goes on during 
first of all, a normal calving so that then we can identify when there might be potential problems that we need to help that particular cow or heifer with. We divide the calving process, big word parturition, into three different stages. Stage one is that that occurs, then the scientists say, anywhere from two to 24 hours prior to the actual delivery of the calf. The key things that are happening during stage one, number one is the dilation of the cervix. And just due to some hormonal changes that are taking place to this cow or heifer prior to calving, then the relaxation of that cervix, and it has to be dilated before that calf is going to be delivered. Some other things that'll take place during stage one, of course, are in many instances, there'll be some behavioral changes to that cow or the heifer. It'll be the one that'll begin to isolate herself away from the rest of the herd. Uh, she may show some twitching of the tail, kicking at the belly, uh, just some general dis discomfort. Now, some of these cattle will never have those behavioral changes, but th that's something that you can watch for. Something else in stage one that I think is key to uh, really evaluating when a cow or heifer is about to calve is due to, again, some hormonal changes. There will be some softening or some relaxation of the pelvic ligaments, those right around the tailhead. If you see some sinking or some softening of those ligaments, that's a pretty good clue that uh, stage one's about to end and stage two is about to take over, and that's the delivery of the calf. Stage two, we say, begins when we first see the appearance of a water bag or the baby calf's feet, and stage two ends when the calf is totally delivered and out on the ground. Stage two, through the years, I think has been misunderstood in terms of the length of time. Some of our old textbooks would say it's two to four hours in length on average. No, that's not right. Research has shown us pretty clearly that stage two is going to happen to a first calf heifer in about an hour if everything is going to go well. In the case of the adult cow that's had calves before, it's only about a half of an hour. So we want to keep that in mind. If we see the uh, uh, cow that's got a water bag or baby calf's feet, if it's a first calf heifer, uh, she should calve in about an hour. If it's a mature cow, only about 30 minutes. Stage three of calving is that uh, part is the releasing of the placenta, the afterbirth, so, or some people call it the cleaning of the cow. Stage three should be done in at least 12 hours after the delivery of the calf. After that, we call it a retained placenta. Some things to keep in mind in this situation, if the cow hasn't completely cleaned in 12 hours, resist the temptation to getting her up in the chute and actually pulling on that uh, re retained placenta. You'll do more damage to the lining of the uterus and perhaps uh, be detrimental to her future ability to become pregnant. Uh, visit with your local veterinarian. If you have the situation where a cow has a retained afterbirth, there will probably be some prescriptions involved. Uh, antibiotics may help in terms of letting that cow or heifer go ahead and clean that retained placenta on her own. I think that you want to remember these three stages of calving so that you can watch for them and understand what's going to happen uh, in a normal birth. I also would encourage you to go online and you can go to the SUNUP website. That's sunup.okstate.edu. Under show links, we're going to put a link to the pamphlet we call Calving Management for Beef Cows and Heifers. It's an excellent, uh, I think, uh, publication that we put together a number of years ago that'll help you understand what's going on with these cows and heifers at calving time, even those that are having uh, some kind of a difficult birth and you need to give some assistance. I think if you'll read that ahead of time, it'll help you during this calving season. We look forward to visiting with you again next week on SUNUP's Cow-Calf Corner. It's always a great opportunity when county educators get together to kind of compare notes on what's going on in their county. And Josh, what are you hearing from county educators across the state when it comes to crops? Well, what we're talking about right now is, is 
things we don't have, and there's three in particular. There's, we don't have a whole lot of moisture, mm -hmm. we don't have a whole lot of heat, and, and, and we don't have a whole lot of money. And, and those three aspects, or the lack of those three, mm -hmm. are kind of what's driving a lot of our crop decisions around the state right now. How, how does that differ from last year at this time? It, it seemed like we were in a, in a to, in not a totally different situation, but things were a little bit better. Yeah, so, so last year when we, when we take a retrospective look back, we, we had a lot of moisture and we were building moisture all winter long. We had some good snows, we had some good rain. So we were building up that soil moisture, which ended up causing us some issues when we continued to build that soil moisture on into the spring. We're, we're not exactly on the complete opposite situation. We still have some soil moisture present. There are still folks out there with moisture. Um, those are the folks maybe without the heat, right. Um, but, but right now those folks that, that have missed those rains, we're specifically talking about mainly those folks in the southeast or the southwest districts on the panhandle. They really haven't received a whole lot of rains since we took our summer crops out. Um, and so those, those folks are working on, on a moisture deficit. Um, some of the other folks got a lot of moisture, have a lot of growing, good growing conditions, but we don't have the heat. Um, and then once again, we, we get asked a lot of, uh, our educators are getting asked a lot, when we don't have a whole lot of movable or liquid funds, w what are we gonna end up doing? And, and that is the big question uh, that we have right now. When, when would be that, uh, the, the decision deadline? I, I, I don't want to use that term, but, but, but when, when should producers really put pen to paper and say, we need to do something with our crop? Well, it's never a bad time to be doing a little bit of napkin math. Right. Uh, that, that should be always on our producer's mind, and it always is. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to start forming what, what probably is, is the best situation to go in when we start getting into February. That's, that's traditionally when we get a lot of our big snowstorms, right. a lot of our big moisture into the winter. Right. So that's a big decision. We're also very warm in some parts. It's not overly warm, but, but we're, we haven't been traditionally winter cold yet. So if we continue a warming trend on into the spring, we'll start to see some of those winter crops grow and, and start coming out of dormancy potentially um, around that February. So that, that end of February on into the 1st of March is going to be a big period where we're going we're gonna to see a lot of potentially what we need to be doing start forming. What what would be some options for producers to to hold their soil together in February? When it, when, if if we don't get the rains that we need, but they still want to put something out there just to keep it from blowing away. Yeah, that's always a good thing. Uh, I mean, we all know in Oklahoma that keeping the ground in place is, is probably needs to be priority number one. Right. And so we get a lot of folks around that mid-February that'll go to those, those spring oats, uh, maybe even a spring rye. We've heard some talk of spring wheat. Mm -hmm. um, oats, I think, are the more popular. We get that big flush of growth. So if you do have cattle out there, that, that we, we do get a really nice spring forage right. going into our summer pastures. Um, uh, I mean that that's a really nice option uh, if we have if we have maybe a, a, a either a small grain or a forage out there right now maybe we don't want to run the run the dice this year on a summer crop uh, right. we, you know we always have good options with our millets and our forage sorghum teff has always been a real popular one in, in recent years and a lot of our cover crop species you know once again holding that ground in place um, kind of resetting the clock keeping keeping something for those cattle to, to graze and maybe keeping some some funds liquid for your system right. that way we can kind of reset the clock potentially and hopefully and and kind of move forward the the other thing is it's it's not a bad time hopefully with some movement we have with the trade talks to to go in and, and get that. We, we've seen some very positive things. So uh, we're seeing promise once again for our summer grains and our oil seeds. So, you know, soybeans are always looking promising. Corn's always a, a good promising. Uh, sorghum's looking better and better uh, every day. And, and cotton has been a very, very uh, uh, a favorite in recent years. But the big thing that I want growers to consider this year is maybe looking at some of those acres that they've been able to clean up over the last couple of years to look at sesame, because that's also a, a very nice option Option if you are looking to put a, a seed in the ground for grain production in the summer. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Dr. Josh Lofton, Cropping Systems Specialist here at Oklahoma State University. As we kick off the new year, there's a lot of factors that cattle producers need to think about. And Daryl, one of those is trade. So what's the trade picture looking like? 
Well, you know, the last two years we've had a tremendous amount of trade uncertainty. We've had a lot of different issues. Uh, as we saw 2019 come to a close, we began to sort of uh, clean some of those up a little bit, at least hopefully. They're not quite done yet, most of them, but you know, we're on the verge of finally ratifying the new version of NAFTA, USMCA. Uh, so hopefully that'll be done soon. We do have a new bilateral agreement taking effect with Japan. Uh, that should help a lot to sort of uh, uh, recoup the position that we lost when we pulled out of the TPP agreement a couple of years ago. Uh, and we're on the verge, uh, hopefully, of uh, signing a partial trade deal with China, which will begin to unwind uh, some of the issues we've had with them. So all of those things are very positive uh, as we go into 2020. Uh, looks like the potential for beef exports to pick back up a little bit this year, and the overall beef trade picture to be more positive this year uh, looks quite a bit better at this point. So what's the beef demand outlook going to be like? Well, you, you know, aside from the international component, which does look better, domestic demand has also been very strong through the last two or three years. It's been one of the keys as we've increased beef production cyclically. Uh, we finished 2019 pretty strong on beef demand. So, uh, you know, again, it's sort of so far so good. Um, you know, consumer spending is strong, unemployment's low. All of those factors are helping beef demand. Now, uh, we do have uh, lots of meat out there. We are looking at uh, record or very near record production of beef, pork, and poultry. Uh, so there's lots of meat and there are reasons to pay attention to that, but at this point in time, looks pretty positive uh, to continue what we've been seeing on the beef demand side. Well, sticking with uh, beef production, how does the beef production outlook look for the, the year? I know it's pretty early, it's January right now, but what are you hearing? Well, you know, in terms of the overall, you know, sort of big picture, um, you know, cattle numbers appear to have stabilized. We'll be looking for the new annual data that'll come out in a couple weeks to confirm that. Um, beef production is very near to a peak cyclically, so it's not going to go down. Uh, we actually expect it to go up slightly again in 2020, but more stable. So, you know, relative to, con to the growth we've seen over most of the last three or four years, beef supplies will put less pressure on the market. Again, we do have those other meats that we also have to look at as well. Uh, but the overall supply demand picture looks pretty favorable at this point. Well, it's a new year, which means there's new risks that uh, pro cattle producers need to start thinking about. Uh, what are some of those risks that you think that they should be aware of? Well, there's several things out there uh, that, uh, you know, obviously the trade issues, again, we're beginning to resolve some of those, but I would say that they're not over yet, so we have to continue to see that. There's, there's uncertainty still associated with that. Uh, so the overall macro situation is still a little bit vulnerable. The U.S. economy is still growing, but it's growing pretty sluggishly and probably a little bit slower in 2020 compared to 2019. So all of those factors. And then, you know, the final one probably is, uh, is the fact that it's a presidential election year. So there's a little bit of a wild card associated with that. I think we can continue to expect some uncertainty and some volatility in these markets, even though the overall picture looks a little more positive. All right, thanks, Daryl. Dr. Daryl Peel, Livestock Marketing Specialist here at Oklahoma State University. Time now for FoodWise. This week, Darren Scott looks at nonstick cookware. Consumers sometimes use Teflon as the name for any type of nonstick cookware, but you might be surprised to find out that there are different types available. Teflon belongs to the category of nonstick coatings, known as polytetrafluoroethylene, or PTFE. This category of coatings was discovered in 1938. DuPont would later go on to trademark the discovery under the name Teflon. PTFEs make pans non-stick by covering the nooks, crannies, and pores of the metal pan, which in turn prevent food from being able to stick to the surface. However, these types of coatings tend to reduce the ability of the pans to conduct heat, which in turn makes it slightly more difficult to brown foods such as meat. Another disadvantage of PTFE coatings is that they start to degrade at temperatures above 500 degrees Fahrenheit and begin to release fluorocarbons into the air. While these fumes won't cause long-term harm to humans, they can cause flu-like symptoms. However, the fumes can cause greater harm and even be fatal to birds. So it's important to keep these pets out of the kitchen when using PTFE coated cookware. There is alternative nonstick cookware for those consumers who would rather not use PTFE. Ceramic coated pans have a ceramic powder that have been applied to the surface of the cookware, providing it with nonstick properties. However, it has a disadvantage that through repeated usage, the nonstick coating can become less effective. Depending upon the particular need and concerns of the consumer, there are different types of nonstick cookware available. For more information, please visit sunup.okstate.edu 
or fapc.biz. Well, the general consensus for market analysts is that there wasn't much going to be moving in the wheat markets over the holidays. So, Kim, what's been going on the past couple months? Well, more than I expected. Uh, you look at uh, wheat, we got about a 55 cent price increase between uh, really right around the 1st of December uh, through New Year's. Uh, backed off just a little bit as we got into New Year's, you know, often then we gained that back. Uh, so you had a, a relatively good rally in wheat over that time. Uh, corn prices, man, they, they increased about a nickel. They just wallered around, didn't do a whole lot. Soybeans, we picked up 70 cents in beans on that. Uh, cotton prices, a nickel. and But for cotton, I think that's significant in that you went from 64 to 69 cents when early on in the, in the season, we thought cotton prices would stay, you know, in the uh, lower 60s or maybe even in the 50s a little bit. Uh, we, we've got uh, phase one of China. Uh, it's not signed yet, but uh, you know the announcement that they were going to, they had an agreement on phase one. I think that's important over the holidays. And then we had a, uh, we, you know, that small dip in the prices after January one, because at, you know, some producers hold their, their crops, their soybeans, their corn, their wheat to sell it after January one for tax reasons. And we saw that sell and we saw a little dip in the prices, but they've mostly recovered. So focusing on wheat and soybean prices, why did, why did we see an increase there? Well, I think the, uh, the increase in, uh, in wheat prices is mostly export demand. Our, our hard red winter wheat exports uh, sales are about 24% above last year's uh, level. I think part of that is because we got a shipping uh, dock strike uh, in uh, the European Union and they're having trouble getting wheat out of there. You've got Russian exports that are 15 to 20% below last year's level. Russia, for some reason, seems to be holding uh, more wheat this year, keeping it off the market. I think that's su that supported our prices. And if you look at soybeans, we probably got uh, most of that rally because of expectations of, of purchases from China. Is there anything that's catching your attention right now in the markets that could impact prices? Well, you know, yesterday we had the WASDA report come out, uh, also the seedings report. Uh, those reports are, were expected to be friendly to the market. Uh, we'll see uh, how prices react on Monday. Uh, and because, you know, it's going to take the weekend for the, the market to go through those numbers. Uh, you, you know, you look at corn, uh, the market hasn't trusted uh, what the USDA said about corn production. Uh, we should, that should be leveling out. So watching that, signing a phase one over the next week or two, I think that's significant. Uh, you look at uh, U.S. Uh, winter wheat uh, crop condition reports, they're going to be coming out. The market's going to be watching them relatively close. And then, of course, what's going on in the Black Sea with Russia holding back on exports? Uh, maybe we can get some more information on that. Um, you know, we're, we're starting a new year. What are your expectations, you know, going forward? Well, you know, we can go back to uh, November, December. We talked about what I expected wheat prices to be as we got into the harvest time period for uh, the 2020. I said that I'd expected the wheat prices to be up, oh, four seventy-five, five dollars right now. You can forward contract for around four sixty-five, four seventy. We're almost there. If that uh, March contract can stay above five five dollars, it's just really toy, touring with it this last week. We can step that. We'll get another twenty cent on wheat prices. We've got an uptrend in wheat. I think that's going to kind of top out as because you know our crop is made in the March, April, May, June time period. So uh, we've got it established. I think our acres are down a little bit, uh, but we'll we'll see what how that crop comes in. So I'm I'm looking at slightly higher wheat prices. Soybean prices, soybean stocks are relatively tight. I think we could get some higher prices in bean prices. Corn, who knows what's going to happen in corn. There's just a lot of uncertainty there. All right, thanks, Kim. Dr. Kim Anderson, Grain Marketing Specialist here at Oklahoma State University. Now back to the OSU Extension Conference, where your local educators are going back to class this week. It's an opportunity for us to engage as a team local educators, area and district specialists, state specialists. We're also including our land-grant partners at College of Muskogee Nation and Langston this year. We get to hear from keynote speakers, we have concurrent workshop sessions, we have opportunities for agent associations to meet, so it's an opportunity for us to learn, uh, to network, and to communicate with each other at, in a way face-to-face -face, that we don't often have day-to-day -day and year-in and year-out. 
we get to just visit and fellowship with each other again and just like any family come together share our experiences and our stories and things that have happened through the years but also to learn from each other uh, when we hear from uh, what other educators are doing other programs are doing things that they're involved in it helps give us ideas and and uh, create new uh, options for us to consider in our own programming. So our, our educators are very engaged in their local communities. Our state specialists have teaching and research responsibilities often in addition to their extension responsibilities. And this opportunity to engage face-to-face -face gives them ways to plan programs through the year for upcoming months and through the year it gives them an opportunity to brainstorm about new ideas. We email throughout the year, we have phone conversations, uh, but this is a, a live environment for a lot of that interaction to take place. Really one of the, probably the most important, it's just fun to come up here and be with each other as an extension family and be able to spend time and share with each other again renew friendships and see each other. Some people that we worked with a lot of years that we haven't seen for a while, be able to get to see each other and visit again. So we hope that our conference leads to people's honing some new skills, gaining some new ideas, maybe being inspired and energized. So we've had some really good uh, speakers come in, both from a motivational standpoint, perspective standpoint, and uh, so we're really enjoying the conference in, uh, in terms of what it's offering to us and just re-energizing and exciting us about extension as well. We want our educators always to have opportunities to become better at their jobs and to learn about the support that they have from different levels to do their jobs more effectively. That'll do it for us this week. Remember, you can find us anytime at sunup.okstate.edu and also follow us on YouTube and social media. I'm Lyndall Stout. Have a great week, everyone. And remember, Oklahoma agriculture starts at sunup.